Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. It's hard for a lot of people to reconcile what a lot of biologists say about predators and predator control when we often identify predators as the number one cause of of mortality, whether it be a nest or poults or hens or whatever. Uh, so, but you you brought up some stuff that you had been working on, particularly related to nest predation, that we thought it would be really interesting to go into here. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm actually I'm glad to be back. Right. I mean, yeah. you're our first charm. our first repeat yeah. guest. Hopefully, yeah. I, I don't know if that's a, an honor or if I just screwed up so bad the first time. <laughs> I got to come back and redeem myself. Well, no, so. we're glad we're glad to have you back. So thanks for taking the time. But uh, I will mention uh, we may be actually releasing them out of order, so this may end up being the one that goes up first. Awesome. Uh, even though then, we recorded the other one, <laughs> that's all right. I'm back both ways, so it, yeah. it'll work then. So yeah, no. Um, predation is. It's like the third rail of being a turkey ecologist, Uh, you know, for people who, you know, kind of think about, you know, the the whole deal with trains and grabbing hold of the third rail and everything. I mean, it's it's kind of weird to discuss because the emotion around the the concept of um, predation and the management of predation is very pronounced in, in our field. And it's an issue that as as scientists you know there are there are very few hard truths correct like like the the things that have very strict answers to them um and the the popular literature has you know in a lot of cases um predated um the the scientific information on the relative veracity of of how predation affects upland game birds turkey specifically and and how we can address it. Um, you know, a few basic, uh, and I'm just going to talk and you guys jump in and tell me what you want me to you know, like restructure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, effectively, four out of every five nests is lost to some sort of depredation event. Now, and I want to be, and I think this is one of the things that, that you guys want me to talk about. I'm, I'm going to be real clear up front for all the listeners. I view predation as or depredation as two separate activities. There is predation and then there is scavenging. Mm-hmm. And, and we need to be really clear throughout, for my opinion, and I'm going to try and be clear, um, whenever, as we kind of go through this discussion in that historically, with, and, and I'm at fault for this. I've written quite a few papers on, on predation. And, and what eats turkey nests and what eats turkeys. Is, so this is probably partially my fault. Um, we tend to lump everything under this concept of uh, predation. Uh, nest predation is what we call it. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, there's there's really two processes. And, and I'm kind of, I've come around to this the last couple of years. There's really about two processes that are going on. You have some event. So number one is what I'm going to call predation. Okay. Some event that causes the nest to immediately fail, right? Um, a, a coyote or a bobcat predates the, the female. A great horned owl predates the female. Some, something comes in and it eats the female and it eats the eggs. Or it attempts to eat the female and then the eggs are the, okay, I'm going to eat the eggs while I'm here, Okay. And, and that event is a, a uh, it's a very short time frame event, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, bobcat comes in, tries to land on the hen, hen gets away, 
eats eggs as a as a uh, backup, as a secondary type of thing, right? A consolation Coyote, prize. Yeah, consolation. <laughs> yeah, the, the consolation prize is I didn't get the ham, but I'm gonna eat all her eggs. Coyote does the same thing. Um, snakes. Snakes come in, eat eggs right out from underneath the the female wild turkey, right? Um, sometimes they'll eat one, sometimes they'll eat eight, sometimes they'll eat them all. These are these are these are predation events, okay? But there's a second event that has historically been um, lumped as a predation event that I do not now, and this is professional growth in my mind, do not now think constitutes a predation event. That is scavenging. That is mm. post predation event. Something else finds the abandoned nest and eats it. This is typically when you see things like a skunk or a uh, opossum, um, a raccoon, um, jays, your corvids. So your ravens and your crows will often do this. Um, feral pigs, um, squirrels, you know, all the little other things. They're not. Oh, you got real dark right there. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I need to wave that, my hands here. I feel like I'm, I need to do that at least once an episode. I let the <laughs> lights go off, so, so we we make a. <laughs> I think you just blew his mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe so, or at least ball, the light bulb. Yeah. yeah. So, but but when when we think about the concept of predation in in turkey ecology, and, and you know, we tend to just group everything together, right? We group it underneath the nest failed. Correct. Mm -hmm. The nest was depredated. And we, we've historically, and again, I'm at fault for this. We've historically just said, hey, the nest failed. It's a predation event because all the eggs are crushed or whatever, right? So, well, well, yeah, go ahead, please. What, yeah, Brett, I've got a few questions. One, uh, it reminded me of something in the episode that we just uh, recorded recently. We said we were going to ask you about it. Mm -hmm. So, so if whether it's a hunter or, or a predator or whatever, bumps a hen, she flushes from the nest. What, what how much does she come back? Like what Easter. There, so yeah. no, that's a great question. So turkeys are different. Okay. Easterns are really, really flighty. Um, mm -hmm. Back in the old days, um, when I started, uh, well, I don't know, 20 years ago now, we were still using VHF. Um, we would actually go and flush the hens off the nest when they were incubating to collect things like um, clutch sizes and exact nest, nest location and put out flagging and everything. The same thing we still do for waterfowl, right? And, and waterfowl really come back to nest very well. You know, they fly off and then they, whenever the chain drags over them, then they come right back in. We would see nest abandonment rates from a low of about 10% to a, uh, an upwards of 50% in some cases. Um, I'd say probably a good average number would be you lose about one about one of five females would just abandon her nest if you disturb okay. it for for any any reason, right? And that's now, and that's that, particular to easterns, easterns and we easterns, rios and ghouls. We've looked at okay. it in all three of them. So okay, um, so about about twenty percent of the time, twenty percent they don't come you know, back. When, whenever you disturb them, now for us, that kind of shifted with the onset of GPS, right? We no longer had to go flush the nest to find them because we were getting higher resolution data on those birds as they were sitting on the nest. So we could just kind of, okay, she's she's still over there on the nest. Boom. We didn't need to go like measure the nest site because if the nest failed, I mean, we, I mean, let's be honest, we were measuring how many eggs they had. I mean, we know how many eggs a turkey has now. We don't need to keep counting it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it was basically for the location. We want to know exactly where the nest was because that's where we take all our vegetation measurements and, you know, everything centers on the nest. Well, now with GPS, we can get within the size of the tables we're all sitting at on where the nest was, right? Just based on the clusters of points. Mm -hmm. And we have all of the spatial temporal data on that hen. So if her nest gets, um, if there's some sort of depredation event, we see it in the GPS data. So we didn't have mm -hmm. to do, we don't disturb them anymore. So I can't think of the last time we'd had a, for many of our studies, a human caused abandonment mm. um, from a, a just regular birds leaving right now. Um, I actually have this number written down because I look, it's about 10% right now on something pushes the hen off and she's still alive. Okay. Okay. Because that, that's also a different so, event, right? 
Yeah, so basically like a, a coyote or something came, comes through and flushes the hen, and she didn't mm-hmm. die from it, but she abandons the nest she as a result. She abandoned the nest. It, it's more 10% it's more of the nesting in, attempts. Yeah, it's more. It, it's okay. it's much more regular occurrence than juveniles. And and you've actually had some cameras over nest, right? A lot, yeah. I mean, we okay. don't do it as much anymore, but yeah, historically right. we put a lot of cameras on nests. Yeah, and I, so, I remember looking at one of your studies from Rio's, I think, that it was probably a Justin Dribblebiss's work? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah, probably Justin's work. Okay. And so, um, kind of along those same lines, Brett, when you were those cameras just set to take stills or did they take video? Oh man. Um the ones we were using in Texas were just taking stills, if I remember right, because the okay. technology wasn't yeah. as advanced back then. Yeah, I mean, sure. yeah, I think, I think that's I've what advanced I in age, and technology's got a lot better. Um, <laughs> we did get a few videos from um, some of the work we did on Goulds out in Arizona with the Arizona yeah. Game of Fish. Um, but we also had stills for those. We haven't shot a ton of video. And, and to be honest with you, putting cameras on nests has kind of gone out of favor because of the right. abandonment issue. Right. And because of, you know, the fact that the GPS data gives us such a good look at that kind of stuff. Right. Um, there's been a few studies that are, you know, still working on trying to identify what predator, you know, what species are disturbing nests. But mm-hmm. um, most well, of most everybody's kind of walked away from cameras. A bit. Right. Well, where I was going with that is I wondered if you had any data to speak to, you know, the rates of a hen actually being flushed off the nest. Um, with various predators. Did you have yeah. any way to look at that? Bobcats and coyotes are the two biggies. That For we sure. See. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, just, just because they, they just run up on them. Right. I yeah. Mean, mm-hmm. I mean, coyotes are coursing, you know, they're running around. They just, and I don't want to say that they stumble upon them. I mean, there's some sort of a search image there, but you know, they just plow up into them and, and that pushes them off. Um, you know, we usually, What's interesting is whenever we had cameras on nests, we usually would see something, bobcat, coyote, owl, trying to predate the nest. But we'd also get records of stuff that came after, you know, the, the yeah. scavenging part of it. And, right. and mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack on, on this whole idea of predation because... What are we actually managing for when mm-hmm. you start talking about managing wild turkey habitat? And, and I'm going to, if you guys will prompt me, I'll come back to that. But I want to, let me finish the predation thought first. So, so going back to this idea of nest depredation, um, we've always umbrellaed everything under predation. But it's really depreda- a predation attempt on the female and then a scavenging event post after the fact, right? Mm-hmm. And the species that do that are are different. I mean, I you know I, the joke I make whenever I do a public meeting or something is, all right, everybody raise your hand who thinks that uh, raccoons are predators of wild turkeys, and every hand in the audience will go up, and I'll say, okay, everybody who's seen a raccoon run across the field and drag down a wild turkey, please continue to hold your hand in the air. And uh, immediately every hand goes down. And, and, you know, so when we think about predation, what we're really thinking about is two separate processes that are not occurring at the same time. You have an event that somehow causes the female to die or leave. And if she does either one of those things, the nest is going to fail, irrespective of what comes and eats it later. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um. And then if she doesn't come back, the nest, I mean, if the nest fails, if she comes back and the nest has already been eaten, that's not a predation event. That's a scavenging event. Mm -hmm. And and that's something that I've probably misclassified in my career. Uh, You know, and like I said, anybody who doesn't, you know, accept the fact that they can be wrong, you're not in the right business if you're in the business of science, Um, (laughs) you know, uh, because I make I made more mistakes than any 10 people. But but I think about the species that we generally talk about being most prevalent for um, nest depredation in this case, right? And it's the common ones, um, you know, raccoons, foxes, uh, you have bobcats, coyotes. Nobody ever talks about snakes, although I bet snakes are probably 40% of the nests we lose 
Oh, we wow. did in our intro Snakes. episode. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Snakes, Snakes yeah. are a huge deal that yeah. are unmanageable before and and are ubiquitous on the landscape everywhere, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, ravens, you know, your, your corvids, your ravens, your crows, your blue jays, your green jays, if you're in, in Texas, um, you know, but then your possums and, and uh, you know, your weasels, your mink, those kind of things, you know, will happen to find them. So, managing to address predation is not really a thing. It's not. What we do as scientists, which I do this and you guys do this, we all do this, is we go to a nest site and we measure a bunch of stuff, right? We measure how tall the vegetation is and how thick it is and what the composition of species is and how far the trees are from it and how much canopy cover and a whole bunch of other garbage, right, that that we measure on the ground. Um, (laughs) No, seriously. And for the listeners out there, all of you that hunt with upland game bird dogs, I hunt with Springer Spaniels. They're both laying on the floor here. It makes no difference how much vegetation is between my dog and a woodcock. Okay? If she runs up close enough to it, she's going to find that woodcock on the ground. Um, So we measure a bunch of stuff that may not matter to try and determine what actually impacts whether an S is successful or not. So maybe we're thinking about this whole con, and here we go, okay? This is where you guys get to start asking questions. Maybe we're thinking about this whole concept of predation incorrectly in that we need to stop managing for the vegetation that the turkeys like, which we obviously generally know what it is, but there's no certainty to that based on all of our nesting studies. And we start managing for vegetative communities that predatory species don't like. Because if we can do that, we're still creating good habitat. But if we can do that, we can facilitate, hopefully, a reduction in the impact of predation. How you do that, I don't know. Because it would require us to spend more time studying coyotes and bobcats and great horned owls or when whatever, and less time concerning ourselves with what the density of raccoons or possums or skunks or feral hogs is on the landscape. And some of the work that we've been, we started with and some of Aaron Ulrich's thesis looked at whether or not predatory type species were showing um, avoidance criteria for certain places where turkeys were nesting. And there's some evidence that they are. Mm-hmm. You know, the, there's some evidence that some species select to, to not go in areas where turkeys are nesting at, and those nests are generally more successful. Uh, it's not super strong, but it's, some, it's something worth thinking about. Um, and you've got to take it in context of what we're really trying to manage for. We can't manage against scavenging, and there's no reason to. Well, let, let me ask you a question about that, Brad. Sure. It's been kind of bouncing around in my head while you were talking. And uh, I think it's important to articulate very clearly and make sure that I'm, that I'm You'll do you. a better job of it than I will. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about you. I'm, I'm just sure. trying to prompt you to make sure that we everybody's with you. How, how often does a raccoon actually push a hen off the nest and then get the eggs when, when you've been Pretty, doing Pretty, uh, you know, I'm not, it happens. It, it, okay. it happens, but pretty infrequently. Usually, so, that, so even though raccoons are very commonly in the literature identified as the primary nest predator, mm-hmm. you're saying the majority of that you think it's it scavenging. is scavenging, it's, not it's predation. Scavenging after the female has run off. I've I've got that, a picture. That's a pretty important point. No, it is. I mean, but but female, and this is what it is. Female turkeys will defend their nest site. Raccoons aren't that big. And I'm not saying for all the listeners out there, so we can be clear. I'm not saying that a raccoon and and a turkey in a fist fight, that the raccoon wouldn't always win or that the turkey wouldn't run away. Okay. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm saying that raccoons are one of the predominant species that we criticize for being a nest predator. Yeah. I would say it's the primary species targeted in a trapping campaign. Absolutely. hundred percent. But there, there's not a lot of data 
to suggest that they're pushing females off of nests. There's a lot of data to suggest that they come in after the fact and eat eggs. Yeah, they're really they're really good at finding a bunch of eggs that aren't going to make it anyway. Yes, and there was some work done in Louisiana in uh uh gosh, how long ago was that now? Almost ten years ago, I guess, ten or eleven years ago, something like that. Um, that looked at raccoon foraging ecology, where the raccoons mm-hmm. were at on the landscape eating. In, in, yeah. in the it was at the Sherburn Wildlife Management Area, and um, it was, was Michael that, Burns' was dissertation, of, if I remember. Yeah, right. that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, it was Mike Burns' dissertation, and basically they, you know, Mike found that raccoons were not in the areas that turkeys were nesting. In. Yeah, I right? think uh, Mike Cherry, some of his stuff in Florida, they did had a sim- very similar thing. It, it aligned really well with with the uh, burns. Sure, and just on raccoons, um, T. Wayne Shortner. In Texas, he's at um, Tarleton uh, State University right now. He's mm-hmm. a partner chair up there. T. Wayne did his PhD on turkeys uh, at Texas A and M, and he went back and looked at all the raccoon trapping records relative to all the poult count information for the state of Texas. Um, it was a don't ask me when the paper was published, maybe oh five or oh six in in CEPA. and basically found there was no that. relationship between raccoon abundance and brood counts which you would assume if raccoons are having a lot of impact you know that there'd be some sort of relationship with Mm -hmm. higher raccoon numbers lower brood counts and 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 what it comes back to in my mind on this marcus is it's very simple a raccoon is a scavenger a a possum is a scavenger they're passive they're passive foragers maybe that's a good way to look at it right and and a, a skunk a raccoon, a possum, they're, they're passive. They're, they're not active hunters like a bobcat or a coyote. But we group them in the same groups when we think about the predation event. I guarantee to you a possum has, oh, I can't say I guarantee you. I'm 99.99% sure that a possum is probably not pushing a turkey off of a nest. Same with a skunk. Mm-hmm. Probably with a raccoon. Same with feral pigs. You know, turkey, feral pigs are, I mean, yeah, somebody will say, oh, well, we saw the picture on the internet of the feral pig carrying the turkey in its mouth. Yeah, it jumped it underneath a deer feeder, right? And mm-hmm. there was like 40 of them there and it came blowing in on it. You know, feral pigs aren't just running around trying to pounce on turkeys on the landscape, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. passive scavenging foragers. And when you think about that in context, it makes sense. We we very rarely get pictures of raccoons and turkeys together at a nest site or any of these species. So immediately we think, oh, the raccoon pushed the hen off the nest. And then you start putting it together with data on where the hen's at. Mm-hmm. Oh, the hen wasn't anywhere near the nest when the raccoon was there. Yeah. She pushed off five hours earlier. And well, then, then you, you, start- and you see those videos, though, when they are together, the hen mm-hmm. is in is uh running uh, running the raccoon or the possum or oh yeah off. i got a great picture of and i can find it i, I wish i would have had it handy um, i got two great pictures i should have brought today i have a fantastic picture it's pretty low res of <laughs> a, a rio grande who is bowed up on about a seven or eight foot indigo snake and that nice. snake is just boom like this and that hen is she is so bowed up and forward she is flat I mean, every yeah. feather on her is for And I, and, you know, <laughs> and I got amazing. another one that I still, and I'll send it to you guys later. I got another one, and I, and I think that I'm correct on this, and I challenge anybody to prove me wrong. I think that I have the only photograph of a feral hog that actually pushed a turkey off of a nest that's in existence right now. Because we happen to have a camera on a nest site, uh, one of my grad students way back in Texas did, and you could just see the turkey's like tip of her tail fan going out of the picture as a hog sliding in underneath prickly pear, right? So, <laughs> but but whenever we see pictures at nests, it's always just the species that's probably going to eat something, right? And we attribute mm-hmm. that to predation. And I think that we've really got to start thinking from a biological perspective, start thinking about those topics separately. There's things that try to eat the hen. And then I think it was consolation prize, right, Will? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, there's things that try to eat the hen, and if they don't eat the hen, they predate the nest. And then there's things that if they eat the hen or scare the hen off, the nest sits by the wayside. And 
And, and I want to talk about that because that's really interesting, an interesting point. We collect and have been for the last six years, eggshells, whole eggs and eggshells from our nest. I have got cooler freezers downstairs in our building full of nothing but nest specific eggs. If any event that caused the female to leave caused the eggs to get eaten, we wouldn't have any of those. Like, like a feral pig, if they were to push a turkey hen off a nest, they're going to eat every single egg that's there and it's going to be done, right? We regularly, I would say, collect eggs from 90 to 95% of our per day of our nest that the female has left two and we wait. We wait two days to make sure she doesn't come back. We mm-hmm. regularly collect eggs from I'd say probably 90% of those now. Because oh, wow. we've got so the higher resolution GPS data. So something has flushed the hen or killed it. Flushed and, and killed you, the hen. Yeah, and then you come well, back two days later and there's still eggshells there. The eggs, eggs are still there. Right. And but when they're not there. We'd historically, with the, in the old days, you know, back when we were doing VHF, when they're not there, we wouldn't come back for like a week, you know, or five or six days. And maybe that time frame is when those scavenging species would come in. I wrote a, or one of my grad students, Justin, wrote a paper. Um, I'm going to forget the salient details. I think it was in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology, a journal of field ornithology. What, what's the he, name? Uh, Justin Dribblewis. Um, okay. I think it was in 08 um, or something. Okay. And we, uh, try to, old, we, we provide the links to any of them. That yeah, we can find so. it. Was, he, he wrote a couple. And okay. one of them had a discussion of how many different species predated this one turkey nest. And how many different, you know, or, and I say predated in the paper, but I shouldn't have. You know, were, I think I said were present in the paper. Because they weren't really predating it, right? I mean, at what point is predation over? So... He, he found that some of these species were four or five times, you know, different species would show up over the course of the eggshells being, you know, eaten up and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I think that from a, from a concept, from a, let me wrap that part up from a conservation and management perspective of turkeys, right? Um, does predation have an impact? Absolutely. I mean, we know that probably four to, you know, four of every five nests fail due to depredation. Now, broods are a different thing, right? You know, they're working Mm -hmm. on the landscape and whatnot, but four to five, four out of every five nests are predated. But they're not being predated by what people say are predating them. And that's the point I want to drive home. The hen might be being predated by a bobcat or a coyote or an owl or a hawk or an eagle or something like that or a car. You know, but the eggs aren't, the hen's not being run off by a possum or a raccoon or a skunk with, with the level of, or a feral pig, with the level of frequency that we have led people to believe. And, and I think that that's important for us from a conservation perspective, because if we can start managing lands I don't want to say differently and I don't want to say better um, that are suboptimal for potential predator species, but are equally optimal for turkeys. That's a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, feral pigs are generally tied as an example. And and I'm, I'm of the, the general minority, I think in the world. And that I don't feel that, that the, the wild pig, the feral pig is a, uh, has a very large impact on wild turkeys um, at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I think that what impact it does have is probably more spatial disturbance related out of nest depredation as opposed to nest depredation or nest scavenging. So, you, so like they, they just don't like to be in the same place so the turkeys nah, avoid I mean, the pigs? Feral pig, yeah, feral it? pigs generally are, you know, they're in riparian corridors. Turkeys nest in uplands. You know, mm-hmm. feral pigs are usually rooting around. You know, no, you can't find that many pictures of feral pigs, you know, chasing turkeys, you know, across the field <laughs> and eating them, Right. And well, every yeah, that's diet. What, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's what I meant. Like when you said the the spatial yeah. disturbance, you just mean that turkeys are like yeah. if if pigs come in the field, the turkeys are gonna leave. Is yeah, they're what gonna you leave. Mean? I mean they're gonna yeah, yeah, they're gonna displace each other, right? But yeah, yeah. you know, and and the problem with I say this no 
there's been a lot of gut studies done on what feral pigs eat. A lot. Using techniques that I can't even spell. More, more <laughs> or less apply, right? Maybe Will could. Um, but they never find avian material in them. And they never find turkey material in them. Even in some of the highest density turkey areas in the United States, like the Savannah Riverside, I saw one. It just it doesn't exist. Um, I'm not saying they don't eat eggs. I'm saying that they're not pushing hens off a nest with, at anywhere near the clip people think they are. And for feral pigs specifically, the the reason that they have and, and again, I'm not a fan of, of feral pigs, right? I mean, we could if we if we killed all of them on the landscape, I'd be perfectly fine with that. I don't care. Um, but in this particular context, the reason they've gotten such a bad rap is because we go out and we use artificial nesting studies. And they're scavengers. And if they find a pile of tasty tidbits on the landscape, of course they're going to eat it. Hmm. And, and several studies that I've seen have went out and put a pile of tasty tidbits of chicken eggs or whatever on the landscape. And they were the pig, you know, right in the middle of a pig's range. And then when the pig swoops in and eats it, they refill it. Mm-hmm. Like that's a trough. Mm-hmm. They're, they're yeah. feeding the pigs. And then whenever you see an estimate that pigs are responsible for 30% of turkey nest mortality based on a bunch of chicken eggs put inside a pig's range, that's farcical. I mean, it's, it's not even, even within the realm of scientific probability. Mm-hmm. You know, because, I mean, if, if you think about um, sea turtle nests, right? Whenever sea turtles come in and nest, feral pigs are out there on the beaches predating sea turtle nest constantly because it's a trough. It's mm-hmm. a feeding event. But we do the same thing in an upland system to try and study turkey ecology. And we blame feral pigs for eating all the turkeys whenever we're just creating a, a trough out there. Will had a student that did a study that I was fortunate enough to be engaged with. I don't think she had hardly any feral pigs on her uh, dummy nest, right, Will? No, we just didn't have any pigs in that area. There, there weren't pigs in the area. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so, so I mean, what, it, it, yeah. So in that, in that situation, um, yeah, there's some obvious drawbacks to the artificial nest, but do you mm-hmm. think that that same pig comes across that same nest with the hen sitting on it and he either ignores her or he runs it off, runs her off? I, I mean, how do you think, think, how do you think that plays out when she's present? I think that if he ran her off, there wouldn't be a Rio Grande in Texas. How about that? I think that if he ran her off, we wouldn't have any turkeys in Alabama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, these yeah. are Louisiana. I mean, these places are, are ubiquitous with feral hogs, right? Right. Now, I think that the gut instinct, because it's really hard to study the species to species level interaction, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just, it's really difficult. My gut instinct on this process is pigs don't see turkeys that on a nest are that big, bunkered down, right? They don't see them as a a predation item. And they don't interact with them that often. So they probably don't push them off of the nest Mm -hmm. as we would expect something like a bobcat to do. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I and just because people will be listening or probably yelling at me right now. I absolutely agree that there are going to be times when a sounder comes through and it blows up turkey nest. hundred percent. Okay. I don't think that 30% of the nests that get predated on the landscape, which would be half of the total number of nests are due to feral pigs. That's, mm-hmm. that's farcical. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'll challenge anybody to disagree with me on that one. And I'll have that debate all day long. Um, I think that, Females are a lot more willing to sit tight if they know they're not in in predation danger. For instance, snakes. We regularly will find snakes at nest sites where the hens are still on the nest. And we we usually, we've got pictures of snakes underneath females predating the nest while the hen is still on the nest. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've got pictures of the hen pecking the crap out of the snake I and gonna, lining I her eggs back up. Yeah. I saw a video last uh, nesting season 
so it was going it was making the rounds online but you know a hen was really getting after a snake just tearing yeah. it up absolutely you know but she, absolutely. i think she already had her poults at that point but yeah that, that's oh, interesting they, they get, they, get they can they sneak in there sometimes oh, yeah a fox we had a ghoul it's the craziest bird i ever seen in my life we had a Gould's wild turkey in uh, Arizona. She sat on the nest and the fox, a fox, okay? I'm not talking a, a rat. I mean, a freaking <laughs> fox has its head underneath her trying wow. to get eggs out. I, I, we assume. I mean, I mean, you yeah. know, I don't know if they're talking or whatnot, but trying to, we think it's trying to get at the eggs under the hen that is sitting on the nest. She didn't flush. He came back. Well, I don't know it was he or she, but the fox came back over multiple nights, never flushed off her nest, and successfully hatched her brood. What? And he <laughs> stole some eggs out of it. We we think. I mean, we couldn't tell. Yeah, she yeah. had a she, she had was bears. <laughs> she had bears within five feet of her nest site. And she's in and this is not a she was up at the base of a tree or next to a creek. And she had bears, bears like walking behind her and they didn't, they didn't even recognize she was, if I'm a bear, a bunch of eggs is a tasty snack, right? Did mm -hmm. they not smell her? That goes against everything that we think of, you know, olfactory senses in these critters that they can walk between, you know, here in my front door, right? The Fox had its head underneath her. She never left. We had quaddies out there. I don't know about you guys. If I see a quaddy in the wild, I'm running the other way. <laughs> Little creepy monkey looking things. I'm I don't gone. Know. I'm going to have to know. Google that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, they, how do I spell a, it? <laughs> uh, I think it's C-O-A-T-I-S. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was not no saying idea. that word correctly. <laughs> I've said it wrong my whole life. <laughs> so I don't, maybe I said it wrong. But but I, I we have pictures of them within six or seven feet of her on the nest. Yeah. So yeah. either she was literally the indestructible turkey or we don't understand the predation process with these birds nearly as well as we thought we did and and well, i don't know, I, you know i don't know the answer to that who yeah. says I who says ignoring ignoring your problems doesn't make them go away yeah well, <laughs> clearly it did I in think, her case <laughs> yeah i think brett that one thing i really appreciate that you're laying out a different point of view on this and challenging everybody to think about it. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. And thanks for coming on the show to do it. Uh, I want to make sure hangs that up on me. It's like, we are getting him out of here now. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, we're, I'm just going to actually on... edit you out of this. Episode. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just no. waiting on the butt. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I, I but... want, I want to make sure that, that, uh, that I understand and, and uh, the numbers here. Sure, I get kind of rambly sometimes. So, so free. you were, I think you said four out of five are lost yeah. to predation. Generally speaking, and we think that about so, 80% of our nests are lost to some act of the female getting either eaten or pushed off and then the eggs getting eaten. Okay. So, but, but if I'm hearing you correctly, when you say four out of five, that's still something either ate the hen or flushed her off trying to to get her or sc spooked her away and then ate the eggs. That is not including the nest that she gets flushed and then something scavenges it or... or uh, that is. That, that, that uh, would okay. be so... Say, yeah, say a female. So And this is, this is where predation gets really messy, right? Yeah. So there's, there's like different tracks. So you can have a, a female who's on a nest. And she gets eaten right then on the spot. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a predation event. Uh, right. A female's on the nest and she gets pushed off of the nest and whatever pushed her off of the nest eats the eggs right then. Yep. That's predation. a predation event. Okay. Yep. Females on the nest and she gets pushed off the nest because something tries to eat her and doesn't come back. And something else comes in and scavenges the raccoon the next day, comes in and scavenges the eggs, either before she gets back or she never comes back at all. That's an abandonment and scavenging. Yeah. That's the, those are the three basic things that can happen. Mm -hmm. We I can lumped see where, yeah, they, those I can together. see why they would be lumped. And I yeah. can, I can also see why it's hard to wrap your head around. 
uh, but but uh, also I think I already asked you to reiterate this, but sure. you're saying that the the vast majority of times that the hen gets flushed off, whether she gets eaten or she just abandons it, or maybe she's going to come back. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of the time that that happens, it is not a raccoon or a possum or oh, any exactly of these other species. Exactly what I'm saying. I mean, it's more more likely, most likely, coyote, bobcat, or and some sort some sort of large avian predator. Your like raccoons, possums, yeah. skunks, they're coming in after the fact. Now, this is and I, this is weird. It's a process question, right? Mm-hmm. All three of these processes start with the hen being removed from the equation okay yes. she's either predated or she's flushed off and she doesn't return or she's flushed off and she returns the, the hen gets removed out of the equation anything that happens after she's out of the equation is irrelevant mm-hmm. from a conservation perspective mm-hmm. right, right. That, 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 that's what that, i was yeah. where i was wanting to get to is exactly yeah. what you just said is that well if you go and remove all the raccoons those eggs still are gone possums you know yeah. ravens but, whatever, whatever else, even if right? they just lay there they don't yeah, even need to be eaten by something yeah they're yeah. they're done if so, the hen's yeah. gone their eggs are done so yes. brett has anybody actually published anything on trying to tease out these different predation processes on nests where we could go to and look at what proportion went this way versus that it's hard because you have to be able to identify what pushed the hen off the vent mm-hmm. and that would yeah. require video which then puts you at risk of disturbing nests that you don't want to disturb right. now, especially where we're seeing declining populations. You know, there was a there was some work. Oh, the name of the the faculty member, the scientist, is escaping me. Um, Susan, maybe she was at a Texas A and M in Uvalde, and she had tagged some bobcats on. Maybe it was that Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch up there in Roby, Texas, and looked at how the bobcats had moved relative to where quail were nesting at and like what their their movements were. And and I think, Will, to get to your question, we spend a lot of time in 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 turkey biology. I'm gonna tie that back in. We spend a lot of time in turkey biology looking at turkeys, right? We spend zero time. I mean, probably the last time anybody done anything real in depth on it was Mike Chamberlain's dissertation, right? Uh, and because he looked at a lot of predation stuff back in the early 2000s. And, mm-hmm. um, and maybe Mike Byrne looking at raccoons. But we spent a lot of time talking about just the turkeys. And we don't spend a lot of time studying the species that ultimately are, are what is affecting nest success. We spend a lot of time talking about increasing nest success by trapping. And and just for everybody out there that's listening, I'm I'm pro recreational trapping and fur bearer harvest. Uh, it's a, it's a fantastic sport that I partake in when I can myself. But but it needs to the expectations need to be tempered. In that you know the old remove one raccoon or possum does not equate to add one successful turkey nest. Mm-hmm. That relationship does not exist. It is it is unknown for wild turkeys and what we do know about that relationship for other species like say waterfowl is uh unequivocal at best and and, you know so so keep that in mind here but um whenever we talk about this whole kind of predation dynamic it's it's really hard to wrap your head around what we're actually getting at right um we should probably be tagging a bunch of coyotes, just as an example, a bunch of coyotes and bobcats in areas where we're following turkeys. If we really want to understand how those interactions get together. Um, there's a paper that'll be coming out soon looking at about 20 coyotes in Georgia. That yeah, I was going to say, didn't didn't Mike do that on BF Grant? Uh, Patrick. Yeah, Patrick Whiteman, his PhD student. Okay. Did. Um, <clears throat> we're, we are were, doing that. And the Florida work as well. Good. We're p- we're pending fun r- the funds to do it, but uh, coyotes in particular. And Will and I just had a discussion on one of our first predation things about coyotes, wondering about the you know the coyote relationship. But yeah, 
Um, Patrick's I actually he I think his paper got accepted in landscape ecology. I don't want to like Trump is, you know, cheering for that. But um, you know, it was 20, 20 individuals, the relationship wasn't super strong. Um, but you know, I mean you're talking about 20 coyotes and maybe there are only three or four of them are gonna interact with birds over the course of a week or whatever. So it's it really requires a lot of high intensity highly detailed information you know my personal guess on most predation is bobcats if i was if i was really to lay it down i think Mm -hmm. most of it's bobcats i think bobcats are are out there in the woods and that they're pretty efficient hunters i think that them and coyotes are probably one and two um i think owls don't get enough credit but they're a lot harder to study um but the question is (laughs) <laughs> and I hate to be the naysayer here, but what are we going to do about it? Right. Right. I mean, we're not going to suddenly mm-hmm. go out and just, we're not going to go out and just get rid of all the bobcats or get rid of all the coyotes in the landscape. A, it's not going to happen. And B, everybody knows that as soon as you take out the dominant coyote that are territorial, right? They're the, the, you know, bobcats have land tenure and coyotes are very territorial. Well, if you take out the dominant pair, instead of having two, you're going to have six. <laughs> because all the juveniles are going to roll in, right? Mm-hmm. So, so is that a good, you know, focus for us from a from a turkey conservation perspective to spend effort on managing those species? Research on them is important in my mind. From a what habitat or vegetative communities do they select against going in, and are those highly useful for turkeys? And mm-hmm. can we? you know, create some, some mismatch on the landscape to where, where the coyotes want to be and the turkeys want to be, aren't the same spots. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, you know, Aaron had done a little bit, kind of some preliminary work on that with trail cameras um, to will. And this was a little different because it's not at the nest site, but um, a, a student of mine, Aaron Ulrey, who's uh, was doing her master's with me. She's now doing a PhD at the university of Georgia. Um, we went and put um, cameras in kind of like the, the two hectare buffer around where a nest was uh, randomly spaced, you know, um, so we could see potentially what predators were coming to these nest sites and, and when for actual nesting turkeys without disturbing anything or pushing them on the nest. And, you know, we had sites where we'd have feral hogs every freaking day and the nest would be successful. And we'd have a site where we'd see one coyote and the nest would be failed the next day. And we'd have a site where we would see one pig and the next would be failed the next day. Right. Um, so it was kind of a, it wasn't at the nest site, but it was more spatially pushed out kind of around the, we called it the incubation area where we were surveying, um, yeah, to try two, to get a better, you said two hectares, right? So that's about yeah, five about two acres. Hectares. Yeah. Something that's like about that. Five, five acres. acres. Yeah. You know, kind of around, that's kind of the, the area that the hens were using. And, and, you know, we found some, I don't want to tentative evidence that, there are certain areas that some of these pred- you know, potential species that would eat turkeys or nests would not go into, you know, um, like, I mean, raccoons are riparian focus species, mm-hmm. generally speaking, right? We don't mm-hmm. see them running across the uplands that often. And if it is, it's, it's circular, right? They start, they leave and they come back, mm-hmm. you know? So we wouldn't see a lot of evidence at raccoons at a lot of our sites, but we see coyotes and bobcats all over the place. Right. In the uplands because that's where turkeys want to be, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that over the long term, it's going to come down to managing the vegetative communities that are good for turkeys, but then may displace predators. Obviously, more usable space is better. I think that we all, everybody in the world can agree that creating more available habitat and more usable space is beneficial. Um, the reality of that is it's going to have to occur on private lands. Just mm-hmm. That's it. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no way that public lands can support this. Um, so if, let me, let yeah, me ahead, follow please. up on that. Brett. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm, I like this idea a lot. It's making this challenge on me and I like that. <clears throat> so instead of ma- trying to manage for a place that turkeys really like, we could, like you've said multiple times, try to create a place that the predators that push the hen off the nest don't like. So that, that's one, Sorry for one saying way it so many times. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's a, that's good fodder for thought to challenge us all. Uh, but another way that you could go 
potentially go about this is to create more space that turkey is like so that you also sort of swamp the predator in terms of where it's hunting so maybe everything that you're thinking the turkey likes is also something the coyotes like but you've made so much of it now that yes. they're kind of, you know it's the needle in the haystack kind of approach so you could go right. either way with that or, it's, or do it's you the think inverse you could receiver. sorry go ahead do you, do you think you could go either way with that you yeah, could that, well, create I mean, more you know, of the things they avoid or create so much that you kind of inundate the predator. Uh, you know, I think we could, right? Because if, so you think about things like predator swamping with waterfowl, right? I mean, they, mm-hmm. they nest in ridiculously high densities in the, the prairie regions. And, and there's just so many birds mm-hmm. there that the predators just, they just get swamped, right? I mean, there's just, you know, I'm better, I'm more successful or the, the group's likelihood of being successful is higher when we're all together. Mm-hmm. Turkeys don't do that. Okay, mm-hmm. Jody Shap showed in I think it was '05 um, that these birds and we're seeing it now. These birds spread out during nesting. Mm-hmm. They they want to be generally speaking they don't want to be right on top of each other. There are exceptions, correct? Um, mm-hmm. It could go either way. Um, we either everybody knows that managing ha- vegetation and managing habitat is the number one thing that all of us preach, right? Mm-hmm. You know, every biologist in the world preaches that. Um, I don't know if we're doing a good job of it. I'm just thinking on the preaching think, part or the, or the, no, we're preaching our part. asses off. I'm not sure it's getting through. <laughs> um, it's getting through to the people that can get through to, but, but how much of a, how much impact are we having on the landscape from this on the private lands that sustain this bird? I mean, Turkey conservation has historically and will in the future rely entirely on what happens on private land. So if, if it's easier to say, you know, under under farm bills or, you know, putting more CRP on the ground or all that kind of stuff in the southern, southeastern United States, if it's easier to manage for more such that the birds are able to spread out, mm-hmm. awesome. If we can't do that, then maybe we need to manage for different. And and to be honest, we as a, as a field, and I'm going to include myself there, we are extremely rutted to the idea that more is better. Maybe targeted worse is better if it's targeted at the right species. Mm-hmm. And and I don't and you know and I don't know what the the right answer for So for all this when is, you say target like you're just saying you're bad for bobcats. Yeah. So if we so creating bad for bobcats is by default it's marginal for turkeys. for turkeys, but bad for bobcats means it's better for turkeys than something that's good for turkeys and good for bobcats, mm. right? Um, and uh, and yeah. I don't know if that's yeah, I don't know if that's possible. It's a it's a tough nut to crack, right? So we've well, always the, went with the easier create more usable space. Yeah. Well, and but it's not you're, doing you're as right. Much good. The, <laughs> you, you may not be able to create enough of it at the scale needed so that the two being preferential like if mm-hmm. if bobcats and turkeys like to use the same place one to nest in and the other one to, mm-hmm. to eat the hen in then we would you know the strategy has been to create so much of that that the bobcat got, kind of gets saturated in that interaction but uh so we've you focused a lot on that but we may not be able turkeys. to we may not be able to create enough of it so what happens is when you see these estimates and some of these studies with single digit per- portions of the landscape being in that kind of vegetation. Now it's kind of becoming a trap Yeah, because they're still going to nest in that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, but all the bobcats are also going to hunt in that. They're going to get predated every time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's and, interesting. You, know, you, know, you have to think about So a little Turkey history here. Nest depredation rates now are, high relative to 30 or 40 or 50 years ago g- generally speaking mm-hmm. um i'm not and i mean we're talking not a difference from 100 percent success to you know 20 percent success you know we're talking yeah you know 30 35 percent success to 20 percent success to 15 percent that type of transition mm-hmm. um we don't have a handle at all nationally locally regionally anything on any sort of changes in um, the meso carnivore guild, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We have no We've clue. Talked about this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to over. You know, we have no idea what's actually out there. 
No, yeah, that's a good the, point. Yeah, most of the data that we get comes from trapping records mm -hmm. or uh, ad hoc survey information, you know, right. that kind of jazz. So, you know, you look at something like T. Wayne's um, paper, looking at the trapping records for raccoons, right? That all hinges on all kinds of stuff we don't have information about. So I don't know if we have more predatory species now than we used to. Or if we just have less space that that turkeys want to be in now that we used to, and that's led to what you were mm -hmm. getting at, where turkeys want to be in this, yeah. predators want to be, you know, things that want to eat turkeys want to be in this. They're all packed into smaller space. So the attack rate, the, not to get overly scientific, but the old locked of Volterra attack rate stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The alpha is now higher because we've reduced the amount of space around it. Yeah. So um, let me ask you. Brett, one thing sure. that came up between us, Will and I, in, in one of our previous episodes about coyotes, and it sounds like they are one that the hen is vulnerable to. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't been that long in a lot of the East, especially up, I think Will said in the Atlantic states, but, uh, you know, that they have moved into the Eastern United States relatively recently. Yeah. And some of those early studies that you were talking about where there was a little bit higher nest success in some of those places was probably before there were coyotes there or, or at least before they were really well established. And I yeah, want, but you do you think that, that the, the coyotes could be playing a, a role in that difference? And you know, I can't say no, saying? no, I mean, and that's not a bad point and I can't say no, but I'd also, I'd caveat that with, you got to think about the fact that, you know, one of the, the monographs, Van Gilder's work, uh, was done in the 80s in Missouri. Yeah, and they, they've, had the they've had coyotes there for, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Rumble's yeah, been yeah. working in the Dakotas for decades. Mm -hmm. And there's been coyotes out there. I mean, and, and all the old the old Rio Grande work in, in Texas, I mean, there have always been coyotes in yeah. the rolling there, plains and everything. So I don't there, know... Here's one thing, though, that I think ties into a lot of our conversation uh, sort of as a alternative perspective on that. And a lot of those landscapes where the coyotes have been there a long time, they're also really open mm -hmm. co compared to the southeastern U.S. by and large anyway. So Fair I wonder enough, yeah. if uh, some of the stuff you were talking about earlier, could coyotes moving into that environment actually uh, heighten the risk of the Turkeys too, oh, because absolutely. the landscape yeah. context There's, is so much different. Yeah, I mean the, the plains of you know Kansas or you know northeastern Missouri are a hell of a lot different than the the national forests, the Ozarks of Arkansas. Yeah, you know, yeah. or or someplace that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could for any species. I don't think it would be mm -hmm. coyote specific, but for any potential predatory species, you could see their um their usable space collapsing. Yeah. And if it's collapsed, you know, they're able to search, cover, whatever, you mm -hmm. know, term you want to use more area, more intensely, which could lead to increased um, predation for, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't think that that's a I think that's a viable hypothesis. Yeah. Um, you know, we did some restoration work. I say we. Louisiana Department of Wildlife Fisheries did some restoration work in Northwest uh, Cattle Parish, Louisiana, in 13, 14, 15, and maybe a little earlier than that. And those birds were put in, and they went off like gangbusters. You know, super high nest success and, and all that kind of jazz um, and, and seem to have stabilized out now, about consistent with, you know, Western Louisiana. Um, you know, I we do. I mean, there's coyotes up there. I mean, we get coyotes on camera traps all the time whenever we're looking at the nesting stuff and everything. Will, um, so philosophically, I, I agree with you that it's possible. Um, I, I can't even fathom how you could strategically try to understand that dynamic though, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I suppose you could backdoor into looking at rain sizes for coyotes and larger areas and then use some of the work that uh, has been done in the Southeast. Oh, I can't remember his name. Well, I think, I think one thing that could be cool, it links back to what you were saying earlier when you're looking at 
like let's say we took coyotes and we're going to try to address this question if you mm-hmm. It'd be kind of interesting to look at across the range, maybe of multiple subspecies of turkeys in very different landscape contexts mm-hmm. and see how much they overlap, like the search behavior from the coyote with the nesting site selection of the turkeys. That's what the uh, the, the faculty member there at AM did at the Rolling Plains quail thing with bobcats. Looked at, yeah. at how... Right, um, so it, if you did that with coyotes, but you did it across multiple states and a yeah. lot of different places, maybe you could start to get at something like that that's really interesting. Another yeah, thing that popped into my head is... space use. Yeah. yeah, another thing that came to my head is I think about, you know, a coyote, what's it doing in some of these really dense places? A lot of times they're just running up and down roads. And then what is a hen? Is the hen seeing a search queue for the edge of the road where you got a little more high sunlight and now she lays her nest close to the road. Like, are we constraining them together? Yeah. I mean, that was the thing, a main thing that I was thinking about when you think about, you know, some of the work that I've done with coyotes and you see them using these upland areas that are relatively open, you know, clear cuts, really young forest. And then on the other end of the spectrum, mature forest that has an open canopy and a lot of understory structure. I mean, these are the places that coyotes like to use that hens do too. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And, you know, you think about some of the areas, I'm not going to say that are poorly managed, but areas that aren't, you know, actively managed for wildlife, right? Industrial forests, you know, that kind of stuff. Not, that's not a criticism of industrial forests. Yeah, right? They have Just, a different objective. So, different objectives. Some of them are, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if, you're, if you're, you know, you know, going to chip and wood at 27 years, then you've got a different objective. And you'll see a lot of the, the historic turkey research has looked at um, nest site placement as a function from distance to road. Right. Mm-hmm. Because that's where the sunlight gets through. You know, they yeah. keep them roadsides wide and everything. And you see a lot of nests in there. And, you know, as Will said, I mean, you're coursing species, your, your coyotes and then to a lesser extent, your bobcats are using those as places to hunt. So you've kind of um, artificially said, OK, this is what's going to be available to a turkey within this landscape. Yeah. And you, in this example, so- stuck the turkeys into a place where you're going to have more chance of interaction mm-hmm. of, of a bobcat and a coyote. So it kind yeah, of sort of back, it's like that, that ecological trap concept. Absolutely. Ecology. That's what, exactly yeah. what I was going to say. It circles back to what you said earlier about, mm-hmm. you know, the usable space idea. If we have more usable space, there'd be less interactions, but if we have less yeah. and it's exactly what both of them want to be in, we've created a, a right. trap for them, you know, and, yeah. and the, the place I've seen this the most readily apparent has been a couple of sites in East Texas with uh, Yopon, right? Creating mm. that, creating that fence line border, um, mm. you know, on the, on, in, you know, the forests mm-hmm. where the only herbaceous grassy areas are along roads and trails. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. where the females so the, seem it, to key. It may not even be the amount available. It may just be the arrangement of it, yes. like the shape or, mm-hmm. or, uh, juxtaposition of, of things together it's just if you take the same amount of good space to nest in and arrange it in a way that makes it really easy to hunt efficiently one long a, strip yeah yeah well, no, like, if it, like it might be a if it's the roadside where the only sunlight getting in is mm-hmm. yeah no that's so a really I'm, interesting i'm discussion. in lockstep with you on it because it's turkey conservation is hard <laughs> like with i mean you know it's it's not deer Right. And, and I don't say that jokingly, but I mean, well, <laughs> we, we study deer forever. And amazingly enough, there's always things we don't know about deer. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but but we never seem to have any problems managing deer. Our problem is we have too many of them, not not too few. Generally, turkey conservation is hard because you're dealing with a species that has a pretty selective niche they like to be in for the most important time of their year. And when they're in that niche, they're absolutely the most vulnerable mm-hmm. that that you can be. And they've got to be there for a month, you know, give or take a couple of days, right? I mean, they're gonna they're gonna be yeah. tied, they're actually gonna be tied to that spot for like 40 some odd days. So you basically take a, a you know a twelfth of this critter's year and say, hey, you're gonna be right here, don't die. Right. And then we've mm-hmm. got to try and figure out how to create the best stuff around it that it doesn't die but that we don't draw in everything that wants to eat it. Yeah. It's a real conundrum wanna, to work under. Yeah. And it's also, they are on the ground at night. You're taking their senses that are most 
keen, yep. you know, their, their eyesight in particular. And yeah, it's definitely put on, putting them in a really hard situation. You know, and, and I mean, I don't have, I mean, I wish I had all the answers. It would make my life a lot easier. <laughs> but, you know, it, but science comes in incremental steps, right? Yeah. And, well, and part of it is doing what we're doing right here, where we're challenging the status quo and thinking about this in different, different yeah. uh, and, viewpoints. And I, I mean, if you'd asked me 20 years ago who the biggest, you know, predator species of turkey, you know, causing turkey nest failures were, well, I'd have been screaming you know, bobcats and coyotes and raccoons and possums and skunks and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I've I've just kind of over time, I I don't want to say matured or grown because that doesn't sound right. I've, I've, I've rethought a little bit about what I'm actually trying to figure out process wise. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. I mean, there's no right or wrong here. Um, You know, so, so I, I, I'm, I and, and others are, are thinking about this, this process, trying to figure out what we can do to adjust, tweak what we're doing for turkey conservation. You know, is it, is it creating, uh, it's obviously more space, is it, but is it a different kind of space? You know, doing a study, like we were talking kind of before the episode started, you know, trying to figure out the relative implications of trapping as a as a management tool is extremely difficult when you're talking about a, a group of birds that might have 12 or 14 breeding individuals in a flock that are going to encompass hundreds of square miles when they go off to nest right mm-hmm. just based on every direction you're trying to go in there and like you know clear that area of a, of one predator species over multiple years, just to look at the effect size, it's, it's, it's untenable. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's easier to do for things like waterfowl. You go, you literally go put a fence around the ponds mm-hmm. and trap the crap out of it. And they just, they, they land inside of it and you're done. Um, so I don't know. I think the solution is going to be coming at it scientifically from different way. What are the predator species doing? What kind of vegetative communities are they using? Um, can selective removals help? I don't know. My gut instinct says no, because they're not targeted towards the primary predatory species. You know, like mm-hmm. you said earlier, you know, Marcus, the, the raccoons and possums and skunks, and that kind of stuff, you know, and you know, we do have a lot yeah. of people that trap coyotes, but they're just not targeted mm-hmm. uh, enough. Well, and um, so along those, they can't tar- target. So yeah, along those some lines. Can't, like, owls. <laughs> mm-hmm. So along those lines, Brad, if you were going to, if you could effectively implement predator control in the case of trying to boost turkey nest success, you would be better off to target coyotes and bobcats than say raccoons and possums. hundred percent. And, and, you know, and I've said this before. So, um, if, if we're trying to turkey nest success hinges on the female staying alive, that's it. That's, that's the, that's the break lever. Right there, okay? If she dies, then the the teeter-totter goes the other way, okay? Mm -hmm. If I was strictly trying to ensure increased nest success, I would focus on the only two things I could focus on, which would be bobcats and um, coyotes. Foxes might be in there. I'm just, (laughs) honestly, I'm I'm unclear. I mean, I'm sure a fox will eat a turkey, right? I know they'll eat poults. I'm unclear what impact they have on nesting hens. I really am, right? Um, but those would be the only two you could focus on. Because we can't do anything with owls. Or you should, to the listeners, you shouldn't. Don't mess with owls. <laughs> um, mm. But um, that would be that would be it to keep the, the female alive. Because if the female is alive, she stays on the nest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, and you also potentially have sorry. years of her doing that multiple yes. years in a row. So that well, was... That's actually an interesting point you bring up. And, and we've started like the, our research groups, you know, that, we're, that generally we're all kind of familiar with each other. Mm-hmm. We're starting this. Uh, for the listeners, most of the babies are made by just a few hens. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so a, f- a few females, and we got pretty good evidence of this right now. There are just a few females on the landscape and they just make babies every year. Boom, 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 boom. And most of the rest of the females don't. 
So if we're able to increase the likelihood that those females that do live, that helps turkeys in the long run, right? Because our most productive mm -hmm. females are making new babies every year. We're starting to see some pretty strong evidence of that in, in some of the data that, that we've been collecting that, you know, the same bird every year, boom, boom, successful mm -hmm. nest, successful nest, successful nest, you know. Did, and, didn't you guys have a paper just recently that uh, actually, no, that I think that was the time, like where they were at in the, uh, I'm trying to think, I, I think it's actually I, a preprint. There's a lot, but which one is it? Was it the, uh, is it an essay Yeah, paper? I can't, I don't know. You guys have, are really productive and it's hard to keep up with what y'all are doing, but, uh, there was a nesting paper that Allison Kiever did. who's was a post no, it wasn't. tech. Yeah. Um, it wasn't that one. It, it was, uh, about the hen. I guess it was the timing. It was about the timing of the nest and relative to other nesting attempts. And I, I, I don't think it was what you're talking about now. No, I'm trying to think. I could probably find out. I'm trying to remember all of them that we published in the last year. We've done work on reproductive timing. Mm -hmm. um, Allison's work, Allie's work showed that earlier nests were most successful every year. We had a paper in, we did some work that was in the bulletin in the Turkey Symposium that looked at some yeah, of the nest that, timing yeah. stuff as well. Um, but I mean, that's, that's also, I don't want to say becoming common knowledge, but you know, everybody pretty much realizes that earlier, earlier nesting, which is typically your, uh, socially dominant older females are generally more successful because it's made up of older, more experienced, socially dominant females that breed earlier. Right. So it's kind mm -hmm. of that weird infinite loop you get into. Um, so I can remember that. And, and that's, I mean, that's really what we're talking about when we get into you know, longer term ideas of things like timing of harvest regulations, mm -hmm. you know, um, someone might not think that, you know, cause this is something that I'm, I'm a proponent of, you know, just to, cause this ties in kind of into the nesting and into predation stuff. Right. Um, every bit of research has ever been shown on turkeys has basically shown that the earlier you nest, the more likely you are to be successful as, as a group of nesting birds. Right. So if you're on the early end of the spectrum, you're more likely to be successful than at the late end of the spectrum. And it's pretty big odds. I mean, it's like you're like four or five times more successful to be early. Or you're going, sorry, if you're early, you're four or five times more likely to be successful than if you're later in the nesting season, right? So some of the pushes that um, policy related pushes that I've made, that Mike Chamberlain has made, that several people are doing research on, well, I mean, you're involved, you know, are looking at regulatory timing of hunting seasons. Um, and, you know, we're proponents of season dates starting later. I, and I, everybody listening, my email is brett at lsu.edu. You can email me and tell me that I'm wrong. I am a proponent of season starting dates being later because it's not three weeks that matters. It's three days mm. or four days of birds or, or six days of birds being able to breed and get out early before dominant breeding males are harvested, that can be the difference between 20 or 30% more nest success every year because you're getting those older females bred and out earlier. Okay, I don't care what happens with the juvenile hen that doesn't go nest the first time until the, the middle of May, right? I care about what's happening mm -hmm. at the beginning of April. And, you know, everybody says, oh, we don't talk about things like hunting season timing for upland other upland game birds. All right. My buddy Adam Butler has said this many times. Mm -hmm. Adam and I are good friends. I disagree with Adam 100% on this topic when it comes to reproductive ecology because we don't shoot pheasants in May. To use his mm -hmm. example, uh, we, we don't do that. We don't shoot pheasants in May. If we yeah, shot pheasants, in, if we went and shot ducks in June, the waterfowl community would be having a cow. But well, I was going to say, is, is turkeys the only, are they the only game bird that we shoot during as their... As far as I know, in the United States, maybe there's a grouse um, that we harvest during the reproductive season, but turkeys are the only yeah. upland game bird that we hunt, not at the peak of breeding season, 
usually before it. And if yeah. you look at Healy and Powell's 99 work, they actually say that we shouldn't open any turkey hunting seasons mm -hmm. until after the midpoint of reproduction, which right. for our data generally is late April, right? Just based on the, yeah. the, the when half mm -hmm. the nests are, are done. Um, so a lot of states have started to push that starting date back because turkeys are the only species that we shoot at the in the middle of their reproductive season. And 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 it drives me nuts when people say we need to shoot them earlier. And I'm willing to die on this hill, right? Because well, they're the only one we do it to. Yeah. And well, everybody lose their you. mind if we shot deer in June or ducks or right. whatever, but we, we're okay doing it with turkeys. That's but bringing that full term. <laughs> that's because they gobble, right? Yeah. Although I did have one strutting on a trail camera at a trap site the other day. But bringing it full circle, if we get those six days, right? If those six days push out three more hens that are older, dominant, and more likely to be successful, then a one-week lag, you know, a 10-day lag, you know, some of the stuff that's happened in Louisiana, you know, South Carolina, Arkansas, that the only thing we're, we're cutting back is the earliness with which people can get out and shoot birds. Mm -hmm. And and I'd trade a few days for increased reproduction and longer term sustainability at the continental scale. If it only cost me three or four days worth of breeding time or, you know, a week worth of breeding time. So it, that's how it ties back into this whole reproductive mm -hmm. thing that, you know, and then bringing it full circle predator predatory species typically have to catch up to the pulse right like turkeys don't just get out mm -hmm. on the landscape and then immediately they get predated there's a lag in the time that it takes predators to realize they're available because they're not available year round mm -hmm. so early less depredation you know there's less predation they're usually a more dominant individuals it's it's a that type of thing is a win from a turkey conservation perspective Mm hmm. Well, related to that, so the Kiever paper, that one was the mm -hmm. one. Is that the one we yeah, that we'd was like to Allie share? Allie Kiever, she's a postdoc at yeah, Tennessee I know Tech. Yeah, she's a uh, she's great, and she's a uh, working for a yeah. uh, Brad uh, Cohen over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that one showed the relative success of the early in. Yes. Yeah. So, so relative what, success of the females. I think it was about. They were four times, and I'm, I'm trying to go from memory here. I think they were about four times more likely to be successful earlier in the season than later in the season. And then the more vegetation they had around them, excuse me, had a, a minor but positive impact. But the mm -hmm. major driver was what when they nested, like early, it was mm -hmm. temporal, right? And that was, yeah, okay. that was Allie's work. And she used about... Um, I don't know, it's just six or 700 hens that we've been monitoring in the southeastern mm -hmm. United States. So, Yeah, I, I looked at that paper. Um, yeah, so we like to share that stuff. What Absolutely. I think the, uh, about the, <coughs> the uh, links to the hunting, what mm -hmm. about, uh, what uh, can you direct us to some literature on that? Oh, I mean, I think Healy, that's and the, Powell's, Healy and Powell's force, or their, their federal technical report that they wrote in 99 is the Bible on that. And and it's 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 common knowledge that's been lost. I mean, you know, people have talked about it even during restoration that hunting and reproduction are are generally going to be linked together. Um, and you know, socio political pressures being what they are, and opportunity being important. I'm a turkey mm hunter. -hmm. I love turkey hunting. I want to be in the woods as early as possible. Right. Um, historically, what's happened is. We've, um, from a, a field, you know, always moved to have earlier and earlier seasons, and we've uncoupled reproduction from harvest. Because in all other species, it's uncoupled. Mm -hmm. There's a, all other species of wildlife. I mean, deer aren't not getting bred because older male deer are getting shot. The year and a half year olds are in there doing their business, right? We, we've uncoupled that in turkeys for some reason. And it needs to be recoupled. And Healy and Powell has long been the Bible on that. And it's a it's a federal technical report. It's publicly available. If you need a copy, mm -hmm. I've got a copy. I can send you as a PDF. We, yeah, and I think it's chapter five, maybe, where he talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, Bill, I mean, Bill's one of the 
I mean, we're all on Bill's coattails, right? I mean, it's Bill mm-hmm. Healy. We're all on yep. his coattails professionally. And and if he says it, and he said it probably better and more elegantly 20 years before. Um, but it's a good, it's a really good resource for anybody because it's about harvest management and and how harvest balances with reproduction and survival and everything. And it's a really good read too. And mm-hmm. um yeah, it's not it's not overly long either. So. Yeah, and it's yeah because of the way it's published, anybody can have it. Yeah, anybody can have it. You can Google it, or email mm-hmm. me. I'll send you a copy of it. I got a PDF. Yeah, we'll, we'll provide a guys, link to it. As yeah, well, you yeah. guys will put it up. So, so yeah, but I mean, it's a. I mean, I we I don't want to get too far off of predation, but it's all tied together, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, well, it's it's still <laughs> more predation, turkeys just die humans. every yeah more <laughs> turkeys die every year because of a load of three and a half fours or three inch fours yeah. than probably anything else. When. And maybe right. you can, I don't want to <laughs> get us on a different rabbit no, hole sure. because we've been going time. a while, but uh, I, I've also wondered about hunters, you know, and because I have been that hunter and I also love hunting, uh, particularly turkeys. Preach. I wonder about, <laughs> I, I wonder about, you know, we have the, this huge flush of hunting, mm-hmm. uh, you know, up front in the first part of the season. And I have bumped a hen off the nest more than one time Mm -hmm. i just wonder you know you're talking about flushing hens from the nest i wonder how much role that plays we've got data on that um south carolina you know we have gps units on hunters out there for elena garrett's work years ago um and and it was uh, it was at the web uh center wma complex there's a complex of you Mm -hmm. know three wmas down there we just kind of call them the web center um, and we GPS tagged out oh, 1,500 hunters, and it was pretty infrequently. I think that, Will uh, got the genotype on a few. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty infrequently that the hunters interacted with the nests, and but, but part of that's also timing, okay? Mm-hmm. The average, so the average incubation start date usually is about the end of the second week of April. About 80% of your hunting is done. Mm -hmm. So most people, and this is a big hand-waving Brett right now, okay? Most people turkey hunt early. Mm -hmm. And by the time that those females are starting to sit, they're actually starting to incubate, right? They've they've finished laying and they're incubating. Um, Most hunters aren't in the woods, Mm -hmm. right? Um, because just because of how timing works, um, it obviously happens. I mean, I've, I've pushed a, a female off a nest a time or two. I'm mm-hmm. obviously on accident, right? Well, some, yeah, but, some, maybe an early hen and the late honey. Yeah. And, and, but as long as you're, you're in and out, most of the time they don't go real far, you know? So, you know, if you bust her off and she's 20 yards away from you or whatever, you just kind of turn and wander off most, almost all the time they come back. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't, we haven't got any really strong, I mean, and it obviously happens, right? And, mm-hmm. and it, it, they get, it happens more whenever people flush the hen and then they immediately go to the nest site and take a picture and put it up on Instagram or mm-hmm. Facebook or, or whatever. Hey, look, I found a turkey. Uh, don't do that. Yeah, See yeah. the hen fly off, walk the other direction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we but, just got through saying that's the same thing. Yeah. But I mean, you know, but it does practice. happen. Yeah, but um, you know, it, it's not. I don't, I'm not worried about that. Mm-hmm. You know, generally speaking, the distribution, the intersection between hunters and and hens is probably pretty low. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, and probably there are a lot of hens that are out there that hunters walk right by and never, and they're 20 yeah. yards out of way and they sure. never even know that they're there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've, probably, yeah, I've done it too. You've probably done that a lot with tagged birds, and you know they're right there, and you're still. I have. Circled, <laughs> well, not so much me anymore because I'm older and fatter, and my job is to, as I'm sure your guys is do budgets and administer yeah, and solve mm-hmm. HR problems and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. But um, yes, I've I've searched in exactly where I thought a hen was and have her be behind me, and I'm carrying an equipment that tells me where a tag is at. So mm-hmm. um, that kind of stuff, uh, I'm sure it happens. I'm sure that you know it's not awesome, um, but I, but I don't think it has population level ramifications at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it's just, I think it's one off. And as long as the hunters don't disturb the nest, that it's not anything that we really need to worry about. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't walk out there every single day, right? You know, I You're wouldn't go put a camera it, on yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, we do know for a fact that from a lot of camera studies that 
you know, if you put a camera on something, other stuff gets drawn to the camera. Mm -hmm. Like the physical fact that there's a camera there will draw some species to the camera, birds and, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff here will come up and sniff it. So you don't want to like go to a nest, like, oh, there's a nest, let's put a camera on and see what's happening and then bring a whole bunch of other stuff in there that doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Will? I've flushed you, a few. You've been Will got busy there. there doing some. Are they catching turkeys? <laughs> Hang on, let me see if I got an update yet. <laughs> I'm looking. Hang on. Nope, no update yet. Nope, no update from the gang. They must be sitting the second net today, so... <laughs> I hope I didn't ramble too much. I don't want people to no, be bored. No, no, no. This is what we wanted to uh, have the discussion. You know, the predation thing is, uh, that's the issue that that uh, goes viral, we'll just say. that That's what everybody wants to argue about over on, uh, on online. And we're trying to present, as we've said multiple times, is the most well-rounded discussion about it as possible. And, and uh, after having some discussion with you about the, the predation versus scavenging, we thought that that was a necessary part of that discussion. I may so, be wrong. I'll be honest. I mean, and you know, like well, I, I may it, be wrong. It needs to challenge us all to be thinking about it. Even if you were, that still, you need to, we need to be challenged and be thinking about it. We've obviously not solved it, whatever the problem <laughs> is. So we've got to keep uh, challenging each other. But anyway, we, we really appreciate you taking some time to uh, come back and talk to us again. Uh, yeah, even though I think this is going to be great. the first episode with you. That That's, no, no, I'm, I'm good with that. It's just the second, first. Yeah. And if you want that paper, because I'm sure you want to put it up with this. Yeah, we, was, we like um, to link all of them, yeah. It was Nathan. The, the last name was Fife. F-Y-F-F-E. -F -F -E. Right. Yeah, Nathan Fife. And it was a... Um, what oh, was crap. it? The, was um, that I the can Wilson's? see the PDF of it, but it was a, a like predation paper on Goulds. And if you give me... Give me 20 seconds and I'll find it for you. Maybe. Okay. Possibly. Yeah. We'll, we'll link it I'll in email the show it to notes. You. Yeah. We, yeah I'll, we'll I'll email it to you as soon as we get off. Me. Yeah. And it's really cool. Cause it's, it's actually got the photographs in it. Yeah. So you can see the Fox with his head and you can see the bears walking by and see the Turkey. Oh, it's a great little paper. So. No, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Please do share. Now, will uh, you all any, right, buddy? Anything yeah. you want to. I'm good. <laughs> anything you want to leave the the audience with Brett? no i mean you know i enjoy doing this and you know part of our job uh my job all of our jobs is as university faculty members is to engage with the public as much as possible to you know put conservation on the ground the only thing i'd say is you know if, if anybody ever wants to contact me or get information don't hesitate to shoot me a message and i'll i'll respond um mm -hmm. i'm i'm not super social media savvy and I plan <laughs> on generally staying that way. Um, but, but I can always be met, you know, got at my email address or you can find me on the various like Instagrams and Twitter and mm -hmm. these guys can get you in touch with me. And if there's a paper you want to see or pictures or anything like that, I'm more than happy to share. Cause I think that the more information we can get out, yeah. the better off we're all doing. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks again and thanks everybody out there for listening it's been a great conversation and, and hope you all learned something from it let us know uh, if you have thoughts or questions or, or uh, want to get in contact or anything yep appreciate it Brett yeah thanks Brett Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University podcast network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey to learn more about TFT check out turkeysfortomorrow.org